I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about what BBSOC does in terms of training and the training partnerships we support. And I think it's really important to, at this point to uh, really thank everyone in, who's involved in the, the, the previous ATPs, Advanced Training Partnerships, for, for kind of doing what we asked them to do and come together as a collective, because I think the, 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 the sum of the parts is greater than the parts themselves. And so um, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for, for working with BBSOC in this uh, actually unique uh, training partnership. It's the only one of its kind uh, that's funded from across the research councils and the public sector. So we're, we're really we're really very proud of this of this mechanism and the programme. So for those of you who don't know uh, BBSRC and maybe some of you you don't, um, oh there's a screen here, that's that's very handy. Um, we are the, the main public funder of, of bioscience and our remit spans, spans across from everything from, uh, from agriculture right through to um, uh, single molecule crystallography um, and everything in between. But in terms of the agriculture and food security, this is a large chunk of our portfolio. It's about a third of our, of our annual uh, research spend. Um, and uh, it's focused then on, on these kind of four broad areas. Uh, and this is both uh, national but increasingly international priorities. Uh, you'll, you may have heard um, Mark Walport and Joe Johnson this morning announcing another uh, strand of the Global Challenges Research Fund, um, looking at bringing people across from the developing countries into, into the UK research base. Um, but we're also doing a lot of work with our own research base and using that to support international development. So you'll see that sustainable intensification, uh, crop and farmed, farmed animal uh, health, the waste thing again comes up, uh, not only just in, in the ag uh, agriculture and food, but also in an industrialisation of biology or an industrial biotechnology uh, strategy. Um, how do we how do we reuse waste? How do we reduce waste? How do we monetise and valorise the waste streams coming out of, of uh, the industries? And increasingly and importantly, our linkage in the MRC around safety and nutrition. Um, and this leads in very nicely into what, what Bob was saying earlier about the about agriculture as a as a key industrial sector. And um, we are, we like to uh, within the research council we like to put a positive spin on, on a lot of things. So although the, the agriculture and food wasn't mentioned in the industrial strategy, it was tucked in under the bioscience and biotechnology. <laughs> so uh, it means that we can actually do stuff around uh, agriculture without anyone knowing about it, although they, they might now know. Um, it does have a central, as, as Bob mentioned, it's, the, it's uh, one of the UK's largest industrial sectors. And so it's got a key uh, role to play in the, the overall industrial strategy uh, around productivity, around uh, growth and jobs. And that's the, kind of the key driver for, for everything that we're doing at the moment. Uh, again, as mentioned, and, and uh, it employs over half a million people, but I think what was interesting to see in the, when you break down these, these figures is that a large number of them are in the, the retail end of things, which has traditionally been a relatively low, uh, low um, skilled end of, of the of industry. And so what we're trying to do is, is use some of the excellent knowledge emerging from the research base to upskill people in, across the agri-food uh, agri chain. So looking at our overall strategy for skills and careers, and this is not just in agriculture, but it's very much relevant to, to, this, to this audience. Um, we believe that uh, you, you get world-class bioscience by supporting world-class people and encouraging people to stay, to come and to stay in the UK uh, and do the research in the UK is, is vitally important for the long-term uh, sustainability of our research base uh, and for our productivity, our growth and, and uh, high-quality jobs. As, as those of you who have been engaged with the Research Council uh, probably are aware, a large, historically we have very much focused in on, on PhD programmes and that's you know, certainly within uh, kind of my group that's where the majority of, of the budget goes, uh, about £43 million pounds a year into PhD programmes in the biosciences. Um, but what we're seeing more and more and more, and the, and the, the ATP now, the AFTP, has really been uh, catalyzing this, is recognizing that lifelong learning is important, that we need to make sure that people continue to develop the skills that they, that they get at school and undergraduate and postgraduate level, but also when they go into industry or they go into postdoc and go into an academic route, that they don't then think, well, I've, I've done all my training now, I've, I've got my PhD, I've got my master's, that's my training over, that's finished. What we want to try and encourage people to do, and, and the FTP is central to this in, in the agri-food sector, 
is recognising that it's never too uh, never too late to learn, um, which sounds like a, a strap line that somebody can possibly use. Um, and we, we through our BFSD's uh, pipeline and the, the uh, research talent uh, ecosystem, that we identify and nurture talented future leaders, both within academia, which is our, where most of our investment goes, but also recognising that a, a healthy research base within academia helps stimulate inward, inward investment, it helps stimulate the development and spin out of, of small and medium companies, and it helps this, this productivity and growth agenda. I want to pick up on something that, that uh, Bob said about the agriculture and, and uh, vet students. I think that's a it's a valid point, um, and it's actually I'm pushing I'm actually going to push this back to the sector. Um, vets is another matter entirely. We we struggle. Uh, I think we recognise we struggle getting vets into research, and uh, it's uh, I'm glad to say it's not just us who struggle, but the, the uh, our august colleagues in the MRC and the Wellcome Trust also struggle to get vets into research. So any ideas you've got, please let me know. Um, but I, I would say the challenge to, to this sector and trying to encourage people into their PhDs is that it's a very market-led economy at the moment in, in, in higher education. So you've got to make sure that you've got the best projects you can, you can possibly get to stimulate interest in, from, the post, from the undergraduates to come and join your labs, to come and do your research. Because otherwise they will go off and do cancer research or they'll go off and do uh, industrial biotechnology or they'll go off and do something thing else. So the challenge is back is actually back to the sector to say, you know, you've got it up I think you've got to up your game and, and make make yourselves competitive against the rest of the, the rest of the research uh, landscape. So looking at how our support of the, the wider uh, bioeconomy we invest across the across the system. So it's, I mean, it's, we're looking at, although we focus primarily on, on PhDs, but the AFTP is pulling us down into the, the level the level seven um, arena, uh, which we don't often play in, which is it's really interesting to see how that evolves into level eight. Um, we have a number of training partnerships within academia, with industry. We're working much more closely with our with our investments and our partners much more. Uh, so, uh, so my colleague Nikki uh, Wilford is on the executive board of, of the AFTP, and I'm sure she's uh, unfortunately got childcare issues at this. Otherwise, she'd be here doing this presentation. Um, but there are there are some things that we recognise across the biosciences that we need to support uh, and it's again I think this this plays into your thinking and, and the AFTP space as well around uh, the future skills so it's around numeracy um, the bio the biologists uh, have got a tradition of not being very numerate um, the number of people who do biology with a level uh, a level maths is, is is vanishingly small and so when they go in, come into PhD and expect, are expected to do kind of hardcore maths as part of the biology uh, programme, they tend to have a little bit of a freak out over, uh, in the first year. But then they get over it and they're fine. But for agriculture, precision agriculture is really central to the way that the, 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 se the sector can develop and, and innovate and the research council is invested in the, uh, the agrometric centre, which is all about big data for, for farming and for agriculture. So how do we get these skills into, into the people that, want, that work in the, in the sector? Looking at professional skills such as risk awareness, collaboration, translation, project design, Again, this is th th this is something that, that really should be kind of um, uh, motherhood and apple pie to people in this audience. But but actually, it's something that, that is not well taught through the um, through the traditional routes. The AFTP has a role to play to support these kind of skill development within your sector. So make the most of it. Um, <coughs> And what we're what we're looking for is to kind of get people with these skills uh, to become the next generation of, of leaders in the sector, um, who can actually understand and access the knowledge that's in the uh, within the research base. We don't expect everyone to be able to you know work at the research base. That would be that would be crazy. And actually, we want people to work in industry. Um, but actually, how do you access that? How do you access the collaborations? How do you know who to go to? And something like the AFTP, which has got a, you know, a, a wide range of academic partners and a wide range of expertise within the partnership, is a great way for you to kind of tie up and link in with the, 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 the thought leaders in, the, in your sector in the UK.
And it's only through actually by transitioning that knowledge from the research base into practice within within industry, uh, we'll, we'll take agriculture into kind of high productivity, high tech uh, sector. So as I mentioned, the ATPs is, is, is unique. We have, we this was a, a bit of a, a risk, um, and it was one of the first things that I took on my when I took over my role in BBSRC. Um, it's not done in any other sector. Um, across BBSRC, it's not done in any other research council. It is unique to this sector, recognising the unique challenges of agriculture and the food. Um, and it was developed in response to domestic and global pressures uh, on the food on food production. There was a number of reports, I think 2010, 2011, which, which basically highlighted this issue and highlighted the need to upskill the sector. Um, and so what we did was we actually we, we managed to get some some uh, some funding released. Uh, I think it was 11, 11, 12 million over five years to support the ATP program. And the AFTP is a direct evolution of that program. So Carol's mentioned this in a much nicer slide than, than this, and I will be stealing that slide uh, later because it is a really nice slide, uh, with, which is. Um, but it's, these are the kind of statistics that to make an investment, uh, to make investment decisions, uh, as research councils are increasingly having to do, to make the evidence base to, to government to say that it's important to invest. You know, 25,000 hours of training, uh, 1,500 participants, 700 organisations. You know, that's the kind, these are the kind of uh, messages that government want to hear. This, it demonstrates a need by the sector, it demonstrates a need for public sector investment, um, and so we are, we are very happy to, to help with that. So we had initially the three uh, ATPs, and I'm not going to go into the details there because that is the past and we're now looking to the future. Um, but I just thought I'd pick up on one of the uh, a case study we've got, and again, this is something that we really, really need. And if anyone's got cracking case studies, and I'm looking particularly at the, the FTP partners, um, give us your case studies. We were very happy to take as many as you can give us. Um, but this was somebody who did one, I think, one of the Aberystwyth led um, uh, ATP, looking at new ruminant nutrition, and uh, he loved it, and it added value to his his business, um, and he's much more aware of some of the challenges in, associated with with his business. So the AFTP, you know, the, normally if, if a, BBSRC Research Council investments they last for for a number of years, they stop, and then that's it. Um, but we were convinced um, by the partnerships that there was a clear need to continue. We'd, we'd done a great amount of work, as you see from the stats that Carol presented earlier, uh, around getting the industry stimulated and interested in, in, in training. Um, but five years is not a great deal of time to do that. So what we did was we, we, made, um, we made the case, they made the case to us, we made the case to, to our uh, executive to, to release some more funding um, on the condition that we looked at how we, we kind of um, made uh, the whole program uh, work together. Uh, more than, than already the, the, the ATPs were. And we managed to release 1.5 million into the AFTP, which uh, was, was, was really exciting. We're really pleased we were able to do this. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how the, the programme evolves. Um, clearly, there's some great ideas coming through. Uh, I would encourage you to, to make the most of, of the opportunities coming through the AFTP. Um, Ways to link in with new industries, with new partners, uh, nationally, internationally, at different skill levels, uh, from from right from the the kind of level level three, level four, right through to level seven, and even level eight. And we've just we're just starting to think in within the research councils how we can influence the development of level eight apprenticeships, um, because clearly there there's an opportunity there um, to 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 do something level eight. Um, but I think the key thing is here is, is use the AFTPs, use your networks and use the experience of, of the working with, with colleagues to ensure that the skills, knowledge that, that we are putting a huge amount of effort into in the research base actually starts evolving and developing your practice. So good luck with the AFTP um, and thank you very much. Thank you, David. Do we have any questions for David from BBSRC? Thank you. Uh, Tom Howard, Newcastle University. So you, you talked a lot about um, upskilling and transferring of skills from the research base through to, to industry. Would you like to comment on the role perhaps BBSRC can play in transferring innovation, the practice that we heard about with the second speaker, 
it was a potentially difficulty was it only 25% of people are, are bringing new innovation into their sector? What role can the BBSRC play in, in helping promote that uptake of innovative practice? So there are a number of, the number of routes that we, we currently have, and I guess there's two main kind of main routes, which is either through funding funding the person or funding the project. And there are a number of, of routes within the councils, and not just PBSC, but uh, within the, the research councils, and how you can engage with industry, engage with industry partners to get your money, uh, to get money to do some translation work. Um, it's, it's a it's a kind of a difficult one because we, we traditionally have worked in the, the kind of the, the very early research. Um, but we have things like the industrial partnerships, uh, and we have link. We still have the link program, which DEFRA used to have for a number of years. We still run the link program for those with significant industrial investment. We have case case studentships for uh, for DTPs uh, for doctor training partnerships. Um, there's also the opportunity through the industrial strategy uh, challenge fund to to do some work that is all about getting uh, money uh, and uh, and collaborations with industry, um, but also funding the individual giving. People buy out some time uh, to spend exploring the, the, the industry uh, through, through fellowships, through enterprise fellowships, for example. Um, we, we have a, a scheme which is currently on hold at the moment, but I'm, I'm very hopeful that it's going to be un, unfrozen shortly, uh, the Flexible Interchange Programme, which is looking at bringing people from industry into academia and using that kind of two-way movement of people. So there's a number of options. Uh, all of which are on or on, web, on online, um, and I, exp- I encourage you to explore using as many as, as possible. The other thing is, of course, with the movement to UK research and innovation, the hope is that the, the join up between the research councils, fundamental research, and that funded by Innovate uh, is going to be much smaller. That's one of the, the main ambitions, uh, and so working very closely with Innovate and some of the programmes um, you've seen today uh, will, I think, hopefully help that. Mike Story, HDB. You have a number of doctoral training centres. Yeah. How do you see those doctoral training centres integrating across with um, the AFTP and the agritech centres that have got that skills um, agenda within their um, remit? So I'll take the, the, um, the AFTP first. Uh, well, it's clear that there are the, the number of partners within the AFTP who are are holders or are partners within the doctrine and partnerships and so that there's a natural linkage there. Um, I think there's also an opportunity for the AFTP itself to explore how it can do some of its professional doctorates perhaps, the level 8 uh, apprenticeship model, that's that's another route. Uh, in terms of the agri-centres, that's more, that's more challenging because they are much more at the kind of the translation end um, and while we encourage students to, to do that, um, I think we need to balance that translation piece with actually doing some, some research uh, to get their thesis published. Uh, similarly, the, the uh, ag tech centres do have partners within the partnerships, um, within the data doctor partnerships, who can engage with them. Um, and so I think it's on a student by student basis, uh, some will be much more linked in with others, but it's, it's very much for the, the partnerships itself to explore. Thank you, David. Thanks, and thanks for the questions.